Well, good morning to you. It's great to be in the house of the Lord. It's great to be with God's people. And to be with you, that those that I, I can't see, but uh, uh, we're all uh, in fellowship together this morning. Today, uh, my message is Christ and the Golden Candlesticks. Speaking from Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 20, and Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. I guess maybe the key verse in all of that would be uh, Revelation 3, verse 11. And it says, Hold fast that which you have, that no man take away your crown. It's kind of a, a, a solemn and uh, sobering spectacle uh, which unfolds before us in the opening chapters of this book of Revelation. A lot of us, most of us, don't want to go there because it's, someone says it's a scary book. There are seven golden lampstands representing seven churches made up of people like ourselves. They were fashioned of the same clay. They professed the same faith. They were a people of like aspirations, weaknesses, struggles, failures, and successes. And there, in this scripture, walking among them is the resurrected Christ, glorified. He's infinitely holy, uh, almighty in power, uh, be, before whom there are absolutely no secrets, <clears throat> before whom every, every soul is laid bare. And before every church, they're like an open book. One by one, the churches come under his divine scrutiny. And it penetrates to the innermost depth. To each group, he says, with solemn, heart-searching emphasis, he says, I know your works. And to each he addresses some word of counsel, encouragement, approval, or some word of correction, warning, or even a rebuke. To one he says with sorrow in his heart and sorrow in his voice, you have left your first love. They were still going through all the motions of worship and service, but they were largely motions without motivation. There was not that warm, outflowing devotion of earlier days. He said, repent, remember, do your first works. To another, he says, in effect, you have lost the purity of doctrine. You're harboring within your fellowship the wicked heresies of Balaam and, and the Nicolaitans. Repent and set your house in order. Now to another, he says, you've lost your purity of life. You are tolerating in, in the midst of the, the filthy sins of Jezebel and our and you become a partaker of her guilt. Repent, purge yourself, and be clean. Then to another, he says, you have a name that lives, but you know what? You're dead. The church was still coasting on the momentum of its earlier, better days, and there were a few names which had not defiled their garments. Again, the challenge here is repent. To the church of Laodicea, he says, uh, you are lukewarm. You say that you're rich and, and increased with goods and have, you don't have need of, of nothing. 
Don't you know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? And to the church in Smyrna, the, the Lord speaks in an altogether different mood. He says, I know your works and tribulation and poverty. Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give you a crown of life. And then to the church in Philadelphia comes the happiest message of the seven. You have a little strength. You have a little strength. And you have kept my word. And you have not denied my name. Hold fast what you have that no man will come and take your crown. For faithful servants of Christ, there is a perpetual timeliness in this brief message with its implications. So let's look at a little bit of that. It's very possible to lose that which we have. I'm talking about spiritual possessions, uh, uh, spiritual power, spiritual worth. And this can happen on any level of spiritual attainment. You know, among the, the distinguished comrades of, of the uh, Apostle Paul was a man named Demas. His name shows up three times in the epistles. In the first reference, Demas is affectionately included with Mark and Luke, talking about my fellow laborers in, in Philemon chapter, or Philemon, there's only one chapter in Philemon, uh, Philemon 24. Uh, that little book hid between uh, Titus and, and uh, in Hebrews. In the second reference, it seems that Demas has lost something, so that less is said about him now. He just says, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. In Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. In the last reference, all is lost. Listen to what it says. Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 10. Having companioned with such an illustrious group that he was in. <clears throat> How could he fall away from that? But he did. From Paul, uh, I like to call him the Prince of the Apostles, uh, we have a legacy of, of uh, 100 chapters in the New Testament. From Luke, we have the next largest number of chapters, 52. And from Mark, we have the earliest of the four Gospels. And from Demas, nothing. Nothing. Only a rearview mirror snapshot as he departs from that distinguished fellowship and returns to the to the unregenerate world. One that he had come out of. A sad example of people that can fail when they don't hold fast. This can happen to, well, it can happen among the best of people. Where would you ever find a, a, a nobler company of, of, of men than that dedicated group of, of disciples that walked with Jesus? There was Peter, there was John and James, Andrew, Philip, Matthew, Thomas, and other kindred spirits, <clears throat> and Judas. 
11 of the disciples held fast to their place of privilege, blessing, opportunity, but Judas fell. When he left those sacred associations and went out, the scripture says it was night in, in John chapter 13, verse 30. And in the darkness of despair, which followed the betrayal of his Lord, Judas died a wretched suicide. And now this can happen in any kind of place. Remember, the, the most beautiful, most wholesome, most inspiring environment ever provided for human habitation was the Garden of Eden. In this garden, there lived two young people, Adam and Eve. Never since Adam has the world seen another so strong, so noble, so magnificent. And never since Eve has the world seen another so pure, so lovely, so heavenly. <laughs> but they fell. They fell. And the world has never recovered from the shock of that fall. I'm going to point one finger back towards me because in every pulpit there's a potential Demas. In every pew, I'm not alone, in every pew there's a potential Demas. So let's not say to one another, it can't happen here. Well, it can. And in many churches, it does. Rather, we should ask ourselves, in all seriousness, is my life as pure as it ever was? Is my conscience as tender as it ever was? Is my devotion to my Lord as, as, as warm as it ever was? Is my zeal for the things of Christ as pronounced as it ever was? If it is, well, thank the Lord. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, it says, Let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, take heed, lest he fall. Now, we're talking about the possibility of losing what you have. And this can happen in any kind of church. Through complacency, and often in the churches, it's born out of prosperity. This was the big concern of, of Moses as he led his people uh, to the border of the promised land. He said, when, when you shall have eaten and be full, then beware that you forget the Lord, which brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. This was also the concern of John Wesley, who had no fears for his people so long as they remained poor but felt great uneasiness as to whether they could endure prosperity. Walking on carpeted floors, sleeping in soft beds, sitting in cushioned pews. He says, oh, let my people beware lest they forget the Lord. I don't remember this man's name, but he was the Baptist Executive Secretary of New York City years ago. He said this little line, the great peril of the metropolis 
is not the degradation of its slums, but the godlessness of its wealthy suburbs. Hmm. Powerful. Think about it. It's possible to lose what you have through uh, discouragement, growing out of adversity, uh, struggle, and exhaustion. A church in downstate Illinois uh, lost many of its leaders during the depression of the early 30s. Finally gave up in sheer discouragement and ceased to function. Apparently, no hope, no hope. But ladies, this is where you come in. Two elderly women held fast and continued going regularly into that great big old empty church house. They were there every day on the Lord's day. Even on the coldest days, through rain and snow and sleet, they would come and they would unlock the door and kneel in this dismal chill of the abandoned sanctuary and, and, and beseech the Lord to come again in power and grace. Well, you know what? Those prayers were answered. The Lord revived his work in the midst of the years. You can find that scripture in, in Habakkuk uh, uh, chapter 3 verse 2. And there was joy in Jerusalem, uh, Second Chron uh, Chronicles chapter thirty, verse twenty-six, such as as people had not ever experienced in the original dedication of the church. Discouragement had been characterized as the most valuable tool in the devil's workshop. But if you have, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. And those two ladies were not going to give up on the Lord. But it's possible to, to lose what you have through living too much in the past. A church who, who, uh, with a noble past is more vulnerable to this danger than a church that has always been ordinary. You know what? I love this ordinary church. Such a church is too much like the fabled Floji bird. You heard of the Floji bird? Yeah. It's said that this bird flies backwards instead of forward, singing one monotonous refrain. I don't know where I'm going, but just look where I've been. See, a church without a clear vision, a clear aim, is not a happy church. On the platform of a railroad station for several days, there was a large crate with a big dog inside. It was the saddest sight imaginable. A passerby inquired about him and was told, you'd be sad too if you were in his plight. He has chewed the tag off the crate. And so no, no one knows where he's been or where he's going. Hmm. That could be us. But among and along with all the sober implications of our text, there's a happy implication to put joy in the heart of every believer. It's possible to hold on to that which you have. Spiritual possessions, spiritual power, spiritual words.
we have the same spiritual resources and defenses which made the church in ancient Philadelphia invincible. We have the same gospel, the same body of truth, the same doctrinal distinctives, the same great commission, the promise that, lo, I am with you always. That has not been withdrawn. The gospel still has its transforming power to make the the, the foulest clean, to make the meanest noble, and to make the ugliest beautiful. So, we have the same divine overseer who encouraged the faithful Philadelphia. He still walks among the golden candlesticks. And so every soul that listens when he speaks lovingly, understandingly, and with authority. We live and we learn. There was a chaplain in uh, World War II and he, he relates his most profound experience of the war in a simple conversation with his uh, commanding general, Corregidor. The captain, or excuse me, the chaplain had been greatly encouraged as he noted that in every service, every service, whether the attendance was large or small, the commanding general was among those present. One day he called on the general at headquarters, and he was warmly greeted. He said, Chaplain, what can I do for you? Nothing at all, sir, replied the chaplain. I just came to thank you for your constant attendance at our services of worship. I could not possibly tell you how much it means to me and what your good example means to the soldiers as they see their general regularly in the place of worship. After a thoughtful pause, the general said, Chaplain, let me show you something. He pressed a button, and some high-ranking officer came, clicked his heels, saluted, stood at attention, awaiting orders. Quietly, the general said something to the officer and dismissed him. When two others had been uh, similarly called and dismissed, the general said, you see, chaplain, I'm a big shot around here. I press the buttons and the high brass come running. They stand at attention and await my orders. But chaplain, one of these days, I shall not be here. I shall have gone the way of all flesh, here today and gone tomorrow. Chaplain, thank God you are not serving that kind of general. You are not serving an ordinary four-star general of all short-lived power and authority. You are serving the seven-star general of whom we read in, in, the, in the, the book of Revelation. He that hath the seven stars who is alive forevermore and whose kingdom endureth forever. Revelation chapter 1, verse 16, 18, and verses chapter 2 verse 1 and he said never forget that chapter hold fast hold fast that which we have that you have that I have so mo no man can take away your crown this challenge to the faithful is, is more than a call merely to, to hold their own. A defensive rear guard uh, action, however brilliant, is not enough. There must be advance, must be. And to the faithful, several promises are held out by him who, who walks among the golden candlesticks. An open door that no man can shut, or see, a reverential response on the part of those to whom they minister, verse 9. 
an everlasting reward in the new Jerusalem, uh, verse 12, and security through all of the trials along the way to glory. Verse 10 says, I will keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world. So in light of, of this divine challenge, we need to examine our soul, every one of us. For me, you, all of us. The gal that cleans, the guy that messes with the flowers, the guy that picks on the guitar. Yeah. Yeah. All of us. We're all important. Each one. But we need to hold fast that no man will take away your crown. No man. Every year of life should find us pure, stronger, taller in spiritual stature. That's the only way I'm going to get tall, by the way. More discerning, more deserving of uh, commendation by him who had never ceases to walk among the golden candlesticks. Father, thank you for for this message, different kind of message, God, but uh, it's in your book, and we need to read it, we need to, to love it, we need to apply it. So thank you, God, for the wisdom in the pages, in Jesus' name.